Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, then I repented. On behalf of Johnny's family, I, I want to say thank you all for being here and uh, being a part of supporting them in a moment like this. You know, often I remind them that you are a manifestation and a reminder of God's abiding presence and his never failing love in a person's life, especially when they walk through a time like this. So on their behalf, I just want to say thank you all for being here and being a part of this day and helping us Really, we want to celebrate together uh, the life and the rich legacy um, that Johnny established here on earth. So with that in mind, what I'd like to do is pray, and then we're going to hear a little bit of his story from his daughter Sarah, and I'm, I would like to share with you all um, a word from one of the granddaughters as well. So would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We do thank you for your abiding presence and your never failing love. Today's the day that you've made, and I know the scripture says we should rejoice and be glad in it, but today especially, we're praying that you would be the strength and the peace that this family and these friends need in this moment. God, I'm thankful for such a rich legacy. I love sitting around the table and watching uh, Johnny smile and his wit and his comments show up through them. And today, Lord, as we visit together and we celebrate his life, I do pray that in recollecting, it, was, it would be as if his presence was here amongst us. But more importantly than that, we're grateful for the presence of your Holy Spirit, who truly is our comforter and reminds us of the hope we have in heaven. So it's in the name of Jesus that we turn our attention towards heaven. We lift our eyes above this temporary existence and we remind ourselves of the peace and the hope we have in his salvation. So Lord, we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to share with you uh, something that Emma wrote uh, regarding her pawpaw and, and she titled it Names. My pawpaw loved telling stories and his were the best he could remember every detail of the story. He told them as if you were there when it happened. The best part of Papa's stories was the way he lit up when he told them. He loved to tell stories and he remembered them so well. But one thing my Papa could never seem to remember were names. One day he'd call me Emma G. Wacker. And the next day I'm Ikey and Abba would be Mikey. From Emma G. Superhero to Bone Crusher. Every day, it would be a mystery of what my name would be. And ulti ultimately, everybody in the family just became named Bubba. 
So Papa is such an inspiration to everyone, and we all love him so very much. His presence is already missed beyond words. And Papa, you are one. You are the one true superhero. I love you, Bubba. Love Emma G. Wacker, Bubba Bone Crusher, your second granddaughter. <laughs> I want to invite Sarah to join us, and uh, she's going to share something with you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sarah Norris, and I am Johnny's youngest daughter. I promise I won't speak for too long, but just know if you fall asleep during any part of this, just know it was the most fitting tribute to our dad, who'd probably already be asleep if you were here. He could fall asleep anywhere and everywhere in any circumstance, slack-jawed and snoring very loudly. My dad was an exceptional man. He was brilliant and brave, optimistic and kind, and above all else, he was selfless. Dad was born and raised in Union County, North Carolina. His first 30 years were a bit chaotic as he tried on a series of different careers and became a father for the first time to his oldest daughter, our sister Dana. The way Dad told it was that he was just good at so many things and he was trying to find his passion. Mom would say that he was a bit of a mess and that his whole life changed for the better when she walked in. Later in life, dad would emphatically agree with that. My dad met my mom when she was a waitress at Knife and Fork Restaurant right here in Monroe. They met and married in a matter of months and they quickly built a life together. They faced 12 years of infertility, but then they were blessed with three girls in a little less than three years. Dad was clearly incapable of having a boy. In the 35 years that followed, Dad's life turned into a master class of patience and perfecting peacekeeping. Right around the time we all went to middle school, Dad began volunteering with the fire department, which he continued for the next 20 years. Dad loved being a firefighter, by the way. It gave him so much joy and fulfillment to jump out of bed in the middle of the night and race through a crisis to bring reassurance to someone who was living out their darkest day. He also loved all of you and the community that you brought to his life, especially in the years after our mom passed away. While dad was always interested in helping others and serving as a firefighter, it was not lost on us that dad's most time-consuming commitment coincided with ages 12, 13, and 14. Curiously, the clear-headed instincts it takes to run into a burning house is a tool in the same toolkit it takes to raise three teenage girls with a firecracker wife. A hallmark of our dad, a hallmark of our childhood was our dad's easygoing optimism. Not much bothered my dad, at least not outwardly. Dad carried out his responsibilities with such grace, never flustered and always confident that everything would work out. Whenever anything bad happened that necessitated a phone call home in our childhoods, we would always emphasize, ask for dad. If mom answers, call back, ask for dad. <laughs> So often, Dad would try to share his sunny side up, no worries nature with the rest of us and tell us to implement the 100-year rule. Put simply, when faced with a problem, ask yourself, will this matter in 100 years? As an adult, I realize now that this assurance only comes from a close personal relationship with the Lord and the presence of the Holy Spirit. As a teenager, Dad's test was the equivalent of telling someone who was upset to calm down. <laughs> so for the record, it never worked. But ultimately, it didn't matter. Like a rising tide, Dad's self-assuredness was enough to chase off the most unrelenting anxiety. We believed we could handle anything because our dad was in our corner, and he believed that we could. Dad was a man of many words. He had a lot to say, and he had a lot of opinions. He never met a stranger, and he was not shy in telling anyone anything that he felt or thought at any given moment. However, Dad, like many men of his generation, struggled to communicate the things that made him feel vulnerable. It was hard for him to give compliments or praise, to apologize, or to tell people how much he cared about them. It was harder even for him to say, I love you. My mom tossed the phrase around easily, so we caught on, yelling out to Dad, love you, Dad, 
whenever we would end a phone call or leave the house. Dad would nod his head casually, raise his hand in affirmation, and occasionally, but quietly say, you too, Bubba. <laughs> Emma was right. <laughs> Despite Dad's discomfort in verbalizing his love, Dad's love for us was never in question. For Dad, love was a verb, a challenge to do for others, to serve others, to live like Jesus. Dad showed his love by doing, by listening, by correcting, by disciplining, by standing beside of us even in the worst of our mistakes. He showed his love by simply showing up. Dad returned every text message and answered every phone call. He attended every game, concert, pageant, graduation, award ceremony. Likely he was asleep, <laughs> but he was there. For about eight years there, Dad was a one-man moving crew, moving us in and out of college dorms and postgraduate apartments, setting into motion the necessary logistics for our legs, for our dreams to thrive. Our legs too, probably. Dad took interest in the things that made us come alive, and he delighted in sharing those experiences with us. Fortunately for Dad, as we got older, our interest shifted from Barbies and Disney princesses to sports and law and politics and in Laura's case, making his grandchildren, which I think he loved the most. Grandchildren made him soft, by the way. When we were growing up, we would catch the bus at the edge of our driveway, which is about 500 yards from our front porch, and on a rainy day, Dad would stand on the covered awning and yell at us to run faster so we didn't get wet. <laughs> Fast forward 20 years, and he's meeting Abby and Emma at the bus stop with an umbrella. One of Dad's favorite pastimes was watching college basketball with us. He lived for March Madness. In this past college basketball season, Carolina, our team, God's team, <laughs> made an unbelievable NCAA tournament run. On the second weekend, we played UCLA on a Friday night at 9.30 p.m. The game was pure hell for anyone who watched with me, that is. When the game started, I text messaged Dad and asked if he wanted to watch Sunday's game with me in the event that we won. He texted back, of course, baby, in record time. That game went until midnight. Dad stayed up and watched the entire thing. And within seconds of the game ending, Dad texted me and said, what do you want for dinner on Sunday, Bubba? While today is about Dad, it would be impossible to honor his memory without also talking about Mom. I guarantee you that up in heaven, she just elbowed dad in the gut and said, wake up, Johnny, this part's about me. <laughs> Most of you know that mom passed away in 2017 following a two year long battle with cancer. At her funeral, I spoke about her courage and resilience and fighting her battle fists first. I remarked at the time that mom's bravery gave us all a sense of confidence that she would prevail in her battle against cancer. I still agree with that. But only in the past few weeks have I come to appreciate Dad's role in giving us security in the sense that everything was going to be okay. The bigger gift, though, the one I will never, ever forget, was witnessing Dad's devotion to Mom in the final years of her life. For more than two years, Dad committed himself to addressing Mom's every need. He attended every doctor's appointment, every radiation and chemotherapy treatment, and he sat by her side at the hospital during every procedure. In April 2017, when we were told that no further treatment was available, Dad sold his business and retired and moved Mom back home so she could spend her final days with him in the home they built together. In those precious weeks, Dad sat by her bed around the clock, spoon feeding her milkshakes, watching her Hallmark movies with her, and talking to her for hours about the life they shared. Love as a verb. Dad shares those times with her, and in the last few years, Dad made it clear that he was most excited to be reunited with her in heaven. Listen, so far, I've painted this picture of a sweet and selfless and dependable man, and trust me, he was all of those things. His fatal foible, however, was that my sweet, selfless, dependable father also always had to be right. <laughs> what was infuriating is that he almost always was. The man knew just about everything. Which actor was in that one movie? What year that team won that one championship? Which route was the fastest to get to that place? And why Digger Phelps ruined college basketball? <laughs> it's the shot clock, guys. In addition to knowing everything, he could fix anything. 
washing machines, lawn mowers, brake pads, dents in cars, dents in garage doors, which may or may not be related to the dents in cars. <laughs> he was a modern day MacGyver with a Ken Jennings level trivia knowledge. When we were growing up, we would try and challenge dad. He would patiently indulge us. And when we came around to understand he was right, he would delightfully chuckle and exclaim, tell me to take the pot. We would grit our teeth, roll our eyes, and begrudgingly say, take the pot, dad. One of the longest running arguments my parents had was what the temperature in the house should be. <laughs> you see, my mom was hot natured and privy to extreme hot flashes. Plus she liked to sleep under a huge comforter. For mom to sleep comfortably, the house needed to be a balmy 64. Dad, on the other hand, was cold natured and perhaps more importantly, cheap. To acquire the perfect energy bill, the house needed to be 72, thank you. For years, those two would battle it out. Dad tried to outmaneuver mom by upgrading the thermostat and hoping she couldn't figure out the newfangled system <laughs> to adjust the temperature. To his credit, it worked for a little while. One afternoon when I was home from college, I was helping mom sweep a live lizard out of our living room. The scene was chaotic as the lizard was running every which way. Mom commented that the lizard had been in the house for a week. I expressed surprise that it had lived so long. In response, Mom said, it's because it's so hot in here. If your dad would let us keep it colder, he would have curled his ass up and died. <laughs> At that moment, dad popped out of nowhere with the quick, yeah, but so would I. <laughs> With finesse, he scooped up with one hand the lizard and set it free on the porch. That was dad in a nutshell, fixing it and being frustratingly funny at the same time. A few weeks after mom passed away, dad drove to Charlotte to have dinner with me and Katie. He didn't come empty handed either. That's right, Johnny got his first full month's energy bill after mom died and he was the only one able to control the thermostat. And wouldn't you know, the man saved tens of dollars. <laughs> the energy company classified his usage as optimal, which is better than standard, don't you know? <laughs> Dad waved that energy bill around and exclaimed, I can't wait to show your mama I was right after all those years. <laughs> we shook our hands and cautioned Dad to at least get through the pearly gates before asking mom to tell him to take the pot. We were fortunate to spend Dad's final moments with him. All of us crowded around his bed, holding his hands and stroking his hair, thanking him for everything that he'd done for us. After he took his last breath, a single tear fell from his left eye. I'm not a doctor or a pastor, but I know in my heart that dad's tear was because he came face to face with Jesus in the glory of heaven. It was an incredible illustration of God's faithfulness for which I will remain forever grateful. About 15 seconds later, my dad let out a loud gasp. As I said, I'm not a doctor or a pastor, but I am convinced that my dad, true to his word, brought up that reduced energy bill. <laughs> and mom sucker punched him in the solar plexus. <laughs> we are infinitely blessed to have this peace, to know that dad has been reunited with mom and both are walking alongside Jesus, preparing their forever, maybe energy efficient home. I hope all of you take comfort in this same peace, and that if you find yourself in a hopeless situation, you choose faith. I don't know a world without my father, and candidly, it's going to be very difficult navigating this new way of life. From the beginning, dad has been the cornerstone of our family. He was the smartest, most capable man I've ever known. Dad shouldered so many burdens, giving us the confidence to believe that we could do anything and be anything because as long as he was living, he would always have our backs. On behalf of our family, I wanna thank you all so much for coming to honor our father. I hope that you will continue to remember him in the everyday moments, whether it be an oldie song on the radio, an ice cold can of Diet Pepsi, a Carolina victory, or Notre Dame finally getting booted out of the ACC. <laughs> Dad lived as if the capacity to love was limitless and I invite you to continue his legacy by loving one another well. It has been the greatest privilege of our lives to be raised by such an extraordinary person. We love you to the moon and back, Dad. Thank you, and God bless you all.
As Johnny had demonstrated to them how to lovingly walk someone through the valley of the shadow of death, uh, it was a privilege for me. It, in full disclosure, I'm not just a pastor to their family, but I live next door to uh, the Vances. But it was a privilege for me to be able to walk next door and watch his girls lovingly walk with him through the valley of the shadow of death. And um, what it didn't resonate with me until they were sitting at my kitchen table and we were talking about today that I realized I was watching him love their mom by the way in which they loved him. We had a really difficult night at one point, and, uh, and it, was, it was just a difficult night. And um, I went in, and Johnny was on his side, kind of to his stomach, and he was really hurting. And uh, it was Sarah rubbing his arm, holding his hand. We were all praying. We wanted it to stop and wanted help to come. <laughs> but I remember her specifically. And in that moment, I'm telling you, she knew what to do and how to do it because Johnny had loved so well. You know, one of the stories that we talked about around my table is that uh, there were decisions to be made. And they've worked so good together to make some hard decisions. And so per, I guess it was hosp palliative or hospice care, somebody's advice, they, they were going to talk to Johnny about what the next steps were going to be and the transition to the Vance home and all that kind of stuff. And Katie asked a great question. This was her follow-up. Are you ready to be reunited with mom? Not, Dad, are you ready to die? Dad, this is about to get tough. But I just thought, Katie, your, brilliant, your question was brilliant because it acknowledged the reality of your situation, but it immediately put his eyes somewhere else. 
Are you ready to be reunited with mom? And look, in, in the few moments I have to close things, that's a good question for all of us. Because this is where in this room and in this moment we think about our own mortality and not just their loss. And is your passing a moment of reunion? And does it give you hope to look beyond the horizon and lift your head above this temporary existence? Now, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, great church planning missionary, wrote the majority of the New Testament. He was writing to a group of people in the city of Thessalonica. And in that city, Paul had done ministry there and he'd left. And he'd gotten word that they had gotten some things kind of jumbled up since his departure. And part of it was this. As you went into that city, across the gates of that city, they had this inscription in Greek. After death, no reviving. After the grave, no meeting again. In other words, they were annihilationist. The death was the end of your existence. And after Paul's departure, teaching them about who Jesus is and how he can radically change your life and the hope of the resurrection, they kind of wed together this idea, well, if somebody dies believing in Jesus, but he hasn't come back yet, then they've missed out. And so Paul writes them a letter to say, wait, let me, let me try to clear this up for you, okay? And here's, here's how it goes. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, this passage in particular says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. In other words, I don't want you to be uninformed. I want you to know the rest of the story. Because I want you to be informed about those who have already fallen asleep, his euphemism for death. And here's the reason why. I don't want you to sorrow as others who have no hope. Now listen to that, listen to that phrase. What he's saying is, when you sorrow, because you will, our sorrow is different as followers of Jesus because in our sorrow, there's this silver lining of hope. And here's why. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in other words, if I look back and by faith, I believe in the experience of the cross and the empty tomb, then even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. In fact, there's the clue. If they died trusting Jesus it's not that they missed out. They're with him now. That's why it's a reunion. And so if, they, if they're safe with him now, they come back as part of this return. And so he talks about what it's going to look like in this homegoing order. He said, I'm saying this to you by the word of the Lord. In other words, I'm not making this up. This is what God's taught us, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means, it's a double negative in the original language, means it's impossible. It is impossible that we're going to take precedence over people who died before us. And here's why. Jesus is personally going to come back for everybody who's alive in that day. For the Lord himself, watch this, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. All right, the shout is the command of a commanding officer telling everybody to line up. Ruck up and line up. In other words, get your packs on. It's, it's time for us to move. The voice of the archangel is the voice of an angel that's over all the other angels, typically known as Michael. And it seems to be indicating that he's telling, while Jesus is giving a voice of command to everybody who belongs to him, the archangel's telling all the other angels, it's time to queue up. We're about to do some business. And then it says with the trumpet of God. And the trumpet wasn't for music. It was to prevent mayhem on the battlefield. It was an instrument that was shrill and could break through the cacophony of battle so that you could know where to look and where to move and how to move. So all of this is an indicative of he's coming back to set the record straight and to right some wrongs and make the crooked straight and to bring, bring the kingdom that he preached about when he was on the planet. Then. So that happens then. Do you know what? We don't know how long the then is. We talked about it about that reunion at the house at some point. And, and I don't know if it was in the conversation or in prayer, but 
I just had this picture of, it's just going to be a moment. See, it was just a moment for their mom. She was so enraptured by the presence of Jesus, and she was taking it all in, and then just a moment she turned around and said, Johnny, can you believe this? And he said, yeah, you're not going to believe the energy bill. No, 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 he didn't. Maybe not like that. But <laughs> So enraptured. Look, Johnny's so enraptured by the moment and the person of Jesus and being in this place that it's just going to be a moment. He's going to say, girls, Bubba, can you believe this? We don't know how long the then is, but all I know is this. First, he returns, and then there's this reunion. So then, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, literally like snatched up together with them. And the them is everybody who died believing in Jesus and has been with him already. So there's this incredible reunion between us as followers of Jesus, but that's not what makes this thing great. Listen to how he says it. They'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's what makes heaven great. Who's there? I mean, streets of gold and per, you know all the, the jewels that are explained and all the things you can read in the last book of your Bible, the Revelation. But what makes heaven heaven is that you live unfettered, in the presence of the God who made you and saved you. And so, we shall always be with the Lord. Do you know what that means? I know you think, well, it means eternity. Yeah, here's what it means. There's no more goodbye. That you will never again have a moment like this where you will have to grieve a loss or say goodbye. And so he ends the passage by saying, so here. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, you remember where we started? I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be uninformed. They don't have precedence over us. They haven't missed anything. In fact, they got everything. And when he comes back, it's going to be in victory. And it's going to be for an incredible reunion. And what makes the reunion so great is that we get to be with him forever and no more do we say goodbye. So for us, we're going to conclude in a minute, and some of us will go across the street, but that's not the place of goodbye. That bedside was not the place of goodbye. It's just until I see you again. For everybody who belongs to Jesus. And so, Katie, it was a brilliant question. Are you ready to be reunited? We were just passing through. This world's not our home. I'm setting my hope, my eyes, my perspective somewhere else. And so are you. Would you consider it that you're ready to be reunited? I want to invite you. Will you pray with me as we close our time here? God, I just want to say thank you for your grace that you love in an unmerited way. We could never earn it or deserve it. You're just gracious. And thank you for Johnny's salvation, that he, he had this confidence that you were his Savior and his King. And so we know now to be absent from this body means he's present with you. And there has been an incredible reunion. And Father, I pray that the hope of heaven, the reality of your resurrection, and the confidence we have in your soon return would be their strength in the days and times when they think, I should text, I should call dad. Dad needs to know. All those phrases and things that come to your mind that make you, it's like pinging that hurt one more time. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would show up and remind them of the great reunion that he's enjoyed. And that we get to look forward to as followers of Jesus. And Lord, if there's anybody here today that's never asked Jesus to be Savior, and Lord, I pray that just once more in this world, Johnny's story, his life, would point them to faith in you. That, that their family might have the comfort that his family rest in in a moment like this. Lord, thank you for the privilege. I just want to say that you've given me just to be a part of the story and be around. 
And God, you, you have used them to inspire and encourage me. And I pray that you use their story and their recollections to inspire and encourage others. And Father, I ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. This concludes our service here. And we're going to reconvene across the street for a committal service. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling. Shall meet on that.